If you guys could open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. Let me kind of give you the, the, the backdrop, if you will. As God had just freed the Israelites from the tyranny of Egypt. They had been slaves in Egypt for many, many years. God had taken them to this promised land that he set aside for them and allowed them to come in and take over. And he established, God did, a government for Israel. And that government was what we would call a theocracy. Theos, from God. It was a government based upon God as being the king. God would appoint judges, and they would then be leaders of the people. They would be the spokesperson through which God would speak to the nation of Israel. But Samuel got to the point where he was old, and, and he knew that his time was short. He was going to appoint his sons as the next judges. But they were wicked. And that's where we get to this particular point. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said, Make us a king to judge us like all the nations. They want to be just like all the nations. Dangerous. But this thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. They don't want God to be their king, so listen, give them what they want. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. He says, now therefore, heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king or the government that will reign over them. You warn them what it's going to be like when they demand for a king instead of God. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. Now I want to bring this down to today. You know, we know that God says His Word is active and alive. It's alive. Whenever we read the Word of God, it's speaking to us right here, right now. It's alive. It's meant to be applied to today. From this point, let's move it forward to the 1400s, 1500s. What happened then? God had set a perfect storm of events into place. For 5,000 years, the history of known civilization, God had kept America a secret. Civilization, if you will, had no knowledge at all of America. And then this perfect storm of events. Gutenberg comes up with the first movable printing press. And the first book he prints on it is the Bible. And with that, this printing press starts pumping out Bibles and making available to the common peasant, for the first time in all of history, the Word of God. They became extremely literate, extremely literate, and knowledgeable about what the Bible said, even more knowledgeable in many cases, people thought, than the Pope. And you look back at the early constitutions of nearly every one of the 13 colonies, and you see this fundamental concept that they all built into their constitutions that in order to be a part of the government, you, number one, had to be a part of the church. And you had to confess that Jesus Christ was your Lord and Savior. Because they wanted to be accountable to God. They wanted to be accountable to God's laws. They come to the forming of the Constitution, and the very first book that the Congress authorizes to print was the Bible so that all of the people in the country could then learn from this and use this as their basic textbook. John Adams said, if, if we do not have a virtuous people, this constitution, this frame of government that we have, will not survive. Okay, you fast forward. America has just become so prosperous and it's blessing the entire world. We get to 1962, Supreme Court 
all of a sudden decides that they want to kick God out of the school system. And in the next 20 years, a succession of one after another rulings of the Supreme Court, kicking God out. So instead of in God we trust, we're on the very precipice now of having that taken off of our coins. So I say, what has happened? Have not the people in the United States said, we don't want God ruling over us anymore. We want a king, not so much a king. We want big government. You know that over 50% of all the people who live in this country right now are depending upon handouts from the government to get by. That is not the concept of the people that fled the tyranny of big governance before, who wanted to be able to live their own lives, keep their own money, and prosper that way. So here we are now, some 2,500 years later, and as Samuel warned the people way back then, he's warning us today. Let's read what he says. He said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and daughters and appoint them for his chariots, to be his horsemen, and some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and some to make weapons of war and equipment for his, the government's, chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields, the best of your vineyards, your olive groves, and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. I have two employees, young guys, they're in their 20s. One of them is married with two kids. I almost weep every time I have to give him his check because every time I figure out what his earnings are, I have to take almost one third of what this young man makes. A young man trying to raise two kids and be a responsible husband. He has to work two jobs just to get by because the government is taking so much out of his, out of his money. And he will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men and your donkeys. They'll put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servant. And you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. You see, we have this wonderful blessing to be able to choose our rulers. And yet we choose rulers who take away our rights. If we lose our rights, who's responsible? We're at war with the most dangerous enemy that has ever faced mankind in his long climb from the swamp to the stars. And it's been said if we lose that war and in so doing lose this way of freedom of ours, history will record with the greatest astonishment that those who had the most to lose did the least to prevent its happening. History will record with the greatest astonishment that those who had the most to lose did the least to prevent its happening. A pretty hard-hitting short little segment there. And I, I, I want to just make it clear that I believe that it is a work of the devil to intimidate us, to scare us, to frighten us. He doesn't want us to speak the truth. We alone have the truth. The people who live in darkness live in darkness. The Bible is the truth. We have it. We hold it. We're here and we're studying it and we're learning about it. And the purpose is so that we can be light and salt in the world. The devil knows that. And so he wants to do whatever he can to silence us. And he's done a really good job. Same-sex marriage was legalized in California by five unelected, unelected California Supreme Court justices. And I'm making this point. They were appointed by, mostly, Democratic governors. You'll find out why next week. We're actually going to define the two parties and what they stand for. And of course we should be able to speak about that in church because they are taking moral stands. We don't vote for parties. We vote for individuals who stand for moral and ethical issues. 
Continuing, twice California voters responded to those unelected judges by overwhelmingly passing initiatives defining marriage as only between a man and a woman. Unelected judges responded to the people by ruling the initiatives again as unconstitutional, stating that homosexual marriage is a constitutional right. I don't know where they found that. If you read their decision, you'd know they were really kind of pulling it out of thin air. Hypothetically, this is not far here from happening. Hypothetically, shortly thereafter, the church refuses to hire a gay man as the youth pastor. Days later, the church is slapped with a civil rights discrimination lawsuit and goes bankrupt from legal fees. That's something that's very real that could happen very soon. California now, anyone born in the state to change his gender marker on his California birth certificate just with a simple court order. If you were born a male, you can change your birth certificate to say that you're a female. Doesn't matter what you look like, but worse than that, school children in California are now permitted to choose either the girls' restroom or the boys, depending upon whether they view themselves as male or female that day. Now let's define what politics is when it's not. The general rule of thumb is people just look at politics as just this ugly thing and we should not be involved in it. And it is ugly, unfortunately, because the righteous people have stopped being involved. Politics is not schmoozing up to political leaders for favor. It's not playing the game for popularity. It's not seeking favored positions in government for power. And it's not taking illegal contributions. We define it here, the religion of a nation in action. Rabbi Daniel Lapin, he says, politics is nothing more than the practical application of our most deeply held beliefs. If you were to look up the definition of politics in a modern dictionary, it would say something like this, activities associated with government, very generic, very kind of wishy-washy, not real specific. Noah Webster, a brilliant Christian, one of the founding fathers back in the early part of the 1800s, wrote this definition of politics in his first American dictionary. The science of government, that part of ethics, right and wrong, which consists in the regulation and the government of a nation or a state. John Adams, our second president, actually said that politics is the divine science. And we know that to be true because we know that biblically, God says that He is the authority over all governments. If you were to go through Romans chapter 13, politics concerns the defense of that nation's existence and its rights against foreign control or conquest. The augmentation or implementation or the use of its strengths and resources. In other words, the government has a job to do to oversee the use of a nation's resources. A political issue that we are involved in by voting people in or out. Third, politics concerns the protection of its citizens and their rights. The job of the government is to protect our rights. And politics concerns the preservation an improvement of morals. Good government should ensure that there is a, a level of morality in the country that doesn't allow us to devolve to the point where we have now, where you have to have metal detectors to get into high schools. Now, as Christians, as Christians, who gives us our rights? Anyone? Who? God. God gives us our rights. Where do we get our moral laws from? The Bible. Absolutely. So our Bible deals with rights and laws. And so does government. Rights and laws. How can Christians not talk about politics? How can we not 
consider it our responsibility to be involved in the process. David Barton from wallbuilders.com, a great organization, says, Congress never reflects the values of a nation. It only reflects the values of those who voted in the last election. Based on voting statistics, it is apparent that Christians could stop all abortions in one election cycle. The fact that we haven't indicates that we don't know that we have this strength and this power, or we don't care, or we don't wish to stop it. Either way, the blood of the innocent is upon our hands. Strong statement to make to the church, but once again, we hold in our hands the truth. We have the light. The people in the darkness don't. So if we don't vote, we're just giving our vote over to them. Abraham, he was involved with the king of Salem. He was involved with the king of Sodom. He went to war and defeated four kings. Was Abraham involved in the political world? Yeah, absolutely. Pharaoh was so impressed with Joseph his administrative ability, his wisdom. He was in touch with God, and so he appointed him to be the ruler, second to him. He saved Israel because of his involvement in the political world. Moses went up against Pharaoh. Moses then became God's governor and God's lawgiver. Was Moses involved in politics? Absolutely. Nehemiah, with the secular king's permission, he rebuilt Jerusalem. Esther took her life into her own hands and stepped into the king's presence when the king could have taken her life just like that. Why? She got involved in a political process because there was a guy, Haman, that wanted to annihilate the Jews. So she steps in and gets involved in politics and saves the nation. David went to war against the Philistines and the other nations who were coming against Israel, freed them and established the nation, established the government. Was he not involved in politics? Yes, of course he was. How about Daniel? At Daniel's request, the king, the secular king, appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, administrators over the province of Babylon, with Daniel himself remaining as part of the royal court. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Scripture points out that these three young men were top of their class in their ability to wisely administrate the affairs of the government. And so they were appointed to these hugely important positions. Don't we need young men and women, Christians, to step into these places now? Isaiah boldly spoke out in judgment against the nations and kings of Moab and Egypt, Babylon and Assyria, among others. And he was deeply associated with all of Judah's kings for over 60 years. Elijah spoke out courageously against King Ahab, Jezebel, and all the false prophets and followers of Baal in Israel, and was threatened with death by the king as a result. But God protected him. Elisha, in the course of his 60 years as Israel's prophet, Elisha was politically involved in helping soldiers and kings, which included his political actions of repeatedly saving King Jehoram from the ambushes planned by Ben-Hadad. Jeremiah's ministry required him to boldly speak to five kings of Judah. He continually condemned the false prophets and unfaithful priests and prophesied destruction on the entire nation for its idolatry. As a result, he was continually persecuted, but God vindicated him. I say you'd be hard pressed to find any prophet in the Bible who was not involved in either counseling or criticizing the political authorities of the day. Who was involved in politics in the New Testament? Let's just back up. Let's take a step back. Did the Romans run the government of Judah? When you read your Bible, do you find that the Romans are running the government and making the laws? I don't think so. You read through and you see the lawmakers are always referred to as the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But even more, think of this. When you look at America after World War II, 
We went and we occupied Germany and Japan. We did so in Afghanistan and Iraq. But did we take over their entire government? No. We let the local people govern. We are there as peacekeepers. We don't want to see another huge world war break out. And that's our purpose for being there. Same thing with Rome. Who were the lawmakers of Judah? We spoke about that. They were the Pharisees, the Sadducees. And what was the name of their legislative body called? The Sanhedrin. You look at the Sanhedrin, the definition is basically a group sitting together or an assembly. And that's the name given to the council. They had 71 Jewish sages or wise men, if you will, who constituted the Supreme Court and the legislative body of ancient Israel. You, you went to trial before the Sanhedrin. They could throw you in jail. They could have you stoned. The makeup of the council, look at this, included a chief justice, a vice chief justice, and 69 general members who all sat in a form of a semicircle in a session. Does that remind you of anything? Maybe the United States Congress. Did any Christian in the New Testament criticize, disobey, or teach others to do so in regard to the political leaders and policies of Judah? I'm going to read you a hypothetical story. The United States Congress was in a rare joint session. All 435 representatives and 100 senators were in attendance, and the C-SPAN cameras were rolling. The members were gathered together to hear a speech by a descendant of George Washington. But what they thought would be a polite speech of patriotic, historical reflections quickly turned into a televised tongue lashing. With a wagging finger and stern looks, Washington's seventh generation grandson declared, Woe to you, egotistical hypocrites. You are full of greed and self-indulgence. Everything you do is done for appearance. You make pompous speeches and grandstand before these TV cameras. You demand the place of honor at banquets and at the most important seats wherever you go. You love to be greeted in your districts and have everyone call you senator and congressman. On the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. You say you want to clean up Washington, but as soon as you get here, you become twice as much a son of hell as the ones you came to replace. Woe to you, makers of the law. You do not practice what you preach. You put heavy burdens on the citizens and then opt out of your own laws, you hypocrites. Woe to you, federal fools. You take an oath to support and defend the Constitution, and then you nullify the Constitution by confirming judges who make up their own laws. Woe to you, blind hypocrites. You say that if you'd have lived in the days of your founding fathers, you never would have taken part with them in slavery. You say that you would never have agreed that slaves were the property of their masters, but would have insisted that they were human beings with unalienable rights. But you testify against yourselves because today you say that unborn children are the property of their mothers, and those unborn children have no rights of their own. Upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed in this country. You snakes, you brood of vipers, you have left this great chamber desolate. How will you escape being condemned to hell? Do you recognize that passage? Obviously, it is a modern day equivalent in many ways to Jesus speaking to those governing people in, in, in Israel. Matthew chapter 23, read it again. And notice, there was a time when he did not come across as meek and mild. He came across confrontational. He said, I will not stand for you, making a, a, a mockery of my temple. I will come in there and I will overturn your tables and I will throw you out of there. He did that twice. He was righteously angry. And if the church isn't doing that, are we neglecting our responsibilities when so many people are being hurt? Continuing, who was involved in politics in the New Testament? 
John the Baptist, Matthew 14, 3. Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have her. He was criticizing the Roman leader. He was involved in politics. Peter and John before the Sanhedrin said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. They refused to be silenced by their rulers. Paul argued his rights, Paul did as a Roman citizen, appealing to Caesar. He went straight to the highest official in the land because he wanted to preach Jesus to him. He wanted to give the truth to him. He preached to Felix, to Herod, and to Caesar. So, we always look at this and we say, well, what would Jesus do, right? Isn't that kind of the mantra that we judge everything by? Well, what would Jesus do? Jesus called Herod, the Roman governmental official, a fox. A fox was a derogatory term to the Jews. Foxes were vermin as far as they were concerned. Filthy animals, they didn't want to have anything to do with them. He called him a fox. He called the senators, the congressmen, the judges of the Sanhedrin, he called them hypocrites, wicked men, whitewashed tombs full of dead man's bones, snakes, blind men beating the blind, sons of hell going to hell. Not nice words, but he spoke the truth. And it was because he testified to the truth that he was crucified. He is our model. We are called to testify to the truth. We've been given talents and abilities, passions, things that we love, things that we're passionate about. And he says, those are the talents that I've given you. Take those and be busy about the work of the kingdom. Occupy, be busy about my work. And that's part of it. Just get involved. Why do we need Christians to be involved in politics? James 4.17 says, Anyone then who knows the good they ought to do and does not do it, sins. We know immoral men do immoral things. They promote immoral laws. Immoral men get elected who appoint immoral judges, who make immoral decisions. Jesus spoke out emphatically against such immorality. And he spoke up for righteousness in every arena. With every opportunity he had, he spoke the truth and pointed out what wasn't true and what was wrong. Conclusion is this, all politics deals with morality because politics deals with the rule of a nation. And the rule of a nation is based upon legislation and laws. All laws are moral. Whenever you make a law, it is immoral. You, this is right, this is wrong. It's always moral. Christians hold the key to heaven's moral truths. The world is in darkness without our influence. Because America's political system places the reins of government in every citizen's hands, Christians in America are the hope of the nation. If we rose up, we could not only bless our nation again, even in just a few election cycles, we could take over. And in so doing, we would again be a light to the world.